Welcome everybody to the tutorial on voluntary manslaughter. Now, as you'll learn, voluntary manslaughter is only um, relevant in relation to murder. And it refers to a collective um, number of defences that are specific to murder. Voluntary manslaughter, I think, is a um, term really unknown to many members of the public. But if you were to talk to anybody about, say, the Yorkshire Ripper, so Peter Sutcliffe, um, or a more recent case that made headlines, um, a lady called Sally Challen, who was uh, imprisoned for killing her husband. Both of these famous cases have um, considered voluntary manslaughter defences um, really in detail. So the Yorkshire Ripper, um, as his nickname was, Peter Sutcliffe, murdered multiple women, um, probably more than he's been convicted of, and attempted to murder um, a number of women as well, and um, was convicted of murder. But on the basis of a medical diagnosis of schizophrenia, his charge was altered to diminished responsibility, which meant that his charge of murder was lessened to voluntary manslaughter. Um, but as a result, he was transferred to Broadmoor, which is a maximum security psychiatric hospital, to receive treatment. And when he was deemed fit to be um, no longer treated, the court made it very clear, because of the nature and severity of his crimes, that he would have to go back to mainstream prison. Um, as you probably will have heard in the news, he actually died. He died of um, COVID um, not so long ago. So he's he's no longer with us. Um, Sally Challenge, really famous um, recent case because it really marks the significance and the impact of a new offence uh, created um, and brought about by the Crown Prosecution Service in 2015 called coercive control and it's that recognition that abuse in a domestic setting can take a number of different forms. It in essence recognises that abuse is more than just physical, it can also be mental as well. And Sally Challenge spent a number of years um, being not physically abused but mentally abused and, and controlled by her husband and she ended up killing him. Now, she was convicted um, of his murder um, in 2011, and she spent nine years um, in prison for that crime. But her and her children, in fact, campaigned for many years for the circumstances to be recognised. And um, in the end, the Court of Appeal agreed with her that she had killed on the basis of um, diminished responsibility, but being recognised as um, a condition, you know, her her abuse that she'd suffered had resulted in um, a significant altering of her mindset. Um, so she wasn't really in the right mind at the time that she uh, decided to kill her husband. It's that build up of abuse that paints a picture um, of the reason um, that is partially um, excusable. And that's the effect of voluntary manslaughter. Okay, so there's a couple of cases there that you could read um, a bit more about online. Um, there are a number of different cases out there as well that have all considered um, the effects of a potential defence to murder. Okay. So in terms of sentencing, there is a, there is a difference between murder and voluntary manslaughter. So murder carries a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment. And remember that in distinguishing between different hallmarks of murder, so aggravating features, for example, how many victims, the way in which a victim is killed, um, who the victim is, their position in society, such as um, a police or serving prison officer, um, you would be given a longer term of imprisonment, and this is what we call a tariff under Schedule 21 of the Criminal Justice Act. Um, but prior to this mandatory life sentence being 
imposed for a conviction of murder, you used to be sentenced to death. Um, now, this was abolished in 1965, but prior to that, um, defendants who were convicted would receive a sentence of death by hanging. So the reason why we have voluntary manslaughter now is because um, there were a number of campaigners, um, you know, as there still are in the parts of the world today, that campaigned quite ferociously for the removal, the abolition of the death penalty for murder. Um, and, you know, in response to that, although it took um, until 1965 to remove it, just some years before, Parliament passed an act called the Homicide Act 1957, which allowed certain partial defences um, to be raised, which in turn would allow a defendant to avoid the death penalty. Now, before these, of course, the defendant did have the opportunity, and many defendants would exploit the opportunity to raise insanity, because the effect of raising insanity as a defence would mean that a defendant would be excused um, the death sentence, but they would be instead um, spending a significant period of time, probably the rest of their natural life, in hospitalisation in an asylum. Um, this, for many defendants, was more appealing than being sentenced to death. And as a result, particularly in the, in the days where perhaps medical evidence wasn't as robust as it is now, um, many faked that um, to, to do this, to be successful. So really, there needed to be a big reform, a big overhaul of this. And the Homicide Act was introduced in, in part response. I have no idea why, at the same time, Parliament didn't consider um, legislating for the offence of murder, while they only chose to legislate defences. But as it stands, murder is still a common law offence dating back to the 1700s. It's only, as you know, been updated through a number of different um, precedents, so through the courts. But we do have now legislation for the partial defences, these specific defences to murder, which allow a defendant to escape a conviction of murder. OK, so that's a bit about the background. So voluntary manslaughter, therefore, refers to a number of partial defences which reduce a defendant's liability from murder to manslaughter, if it can be proven. Now, essentially, what a defendant is saying is that they have killed and they intended to kill or cause serious bodily harm, you know, is, um, is allowed through vicars. But there are circumstances that excuse their conduct and therefore that should mean that their liability is reduced. Now, if a defendant raises one of these defences, it falls to the prosecution to prove that that defence is not applicable, that that defence cannot be um, shown and therefore a jury should not um, allow it. In instance where, instances where judges refuse for a defence to be considered by the jury, then that obviously could um, result in an unsafe conviction. So for the most part, the jury should have the opportunity to consider defences and it's up to them whether they rule them out. There could be issues where um, jurors have to consider complex medical evidence, that, um, you know, that lack of understanding about certain states of mind and certain um, complex conditions can impact on the validity of a defence. Nevertheless, it is the jury's role um, to do that. So the effect is that the mandatory life sentence will be avoided if one of these circumstances succeeds. So our um, part on the A-level law is to be able to um, apply one or more of these defences to a scenario and advise somebody about whether they would be successful in reducing their liability. So what I thought would be really useful is if you can see as a diagram where voluntary manslaughter sits and it's in the lighter colour, okay? So voluntary manslaughter sits in the fatal offences um, arena. So you've got, you must have at the top an unlawful killing so we must have a death of a victim. Um, 
So, of course, causation has to be made out if we're going to prove the defendant has um, killed the victim. So that cannot be in dispute. And then, really, the intention, the mens rea, will dictate what happens to the defendant and, uh, and what they will be liable for, if anything at all. So if a defendant has no mens rea, no mens rea at all, no, not even recklessness, then there will be no liability. It can be hard to swallow sometimes, but, you know, occasionally um, accidents or mistakes happen. And if there is no liability in law, if there is no fault, then there cannot be um, any consequence to that legally. If a defendant has intended some harm, but not serious harm, let's say a classic example, a defendant punches a victim in a fight, that um, victim falls back, hits their head and dies. You cannot say that a defendant intended to cause serious harm in that instance. Very rarely would that be um, able to be proven. Perhaps a defendant pushes a victim and a victim falls back, hits their head or ends up um, dying as a result. These kinds of actions do not signify intention to cause serious harm. And I spoke to you um, previously about factors that may indicate serious harm, which could be kicking on the floor, planning, premeditation, prior threats, operating in a gang or group. OK, so these sorts of factors can help the prosecution to evidence intention to kill or cause serious harm. But where we cannot evidence that, then the outcome is going to be one of involuntary manslaughter instead. Perhaps if a defendant has failed in a duty that they legally owe to a victim, so doctor, patient, um, employer, employee, parent, child even, then they may, um, they may be liable if that victim dies through them neglecting to take care. Okay. Obviously, if that neglect is willful, is intentional, then that's when we can move to more serious liability. So these, these crimes really do rest on the mens rea. What we are concerned about in this tutorial is this part here. So there is a killing, a defendant has intended to kill or cause serious harm, but there is a reason why they did that. Perhaps they have a medical condition which must be recognised, or perhaps they lost control in the, mo in the moment. They were unable to control their actions. And they, this is the part that we are going to focus on. So there are two defences that we're going to consider. One called diminished responsibility. In essence, your responsibility for the killing is diminished. It's decreased. It's lessened because of your state of mind. Um, secondly, you lost control at the time and therefore impaired responsibility for the killing. This defence was previously called provocation, so you were provoked into killing. And I really do recommend um, a film, an old film called Provoked, if you want to see kind of the history of how this defence used to work. OK, so there's a task I want you to do. Um, you'll have a worksheet for this. If you don't have a worksheet, then you can find this law online. These two defences were previously, as I mentioned in the beginning, set out in the Homicide Act. I want you to see what the defences used to need to be proven. Can you identify the test of the defences? Usually we can separate tests into three parts. So if you can do that, great. And then have a look at the new law. These defences are now in a new act um, or new for the, um, in relative terms, quite new in terms of legal updates. The Coroners and Justice Act 2009. Because in the A-level, we don't need to any longer um, evaluate these defences. We are not going to spend any significant time looking at the old law under the Homicide Act. We are going to look at what the current law is and how we apply it. OK, so we are concerned with the Coroners and Justice Act, and that is the most important part. But what I'll just do um, briefly is take you through the old law. So. If you can pause this and have a look for yourselves and then we can go through it together. So the old law for diminished responsibility was found previously under Section 2 of the Homicide Act. 
Okay, and what the law said was that a defendant must prove, and that's interesting, isn't it? A defendant must prove. I mean, if a defendant is raising a defence, technically there's no need to prove anything. What the prosecution must do is disprove if a defendant brings evidence. So in a sense, the burden of proof rests on the prosecution to prove that a defendant has killed and had intention to kill. They must disprove any defences that a defendant raises. But if you raise a defence as a defendant, you do need to bring evidence to show that that was the case at the time. So in a way, it does practically fall to you to, to show that this is the case. If you're going to claim that you were that your responsibility was diminished at the time of the killing, you have to bring evidence to show that otherwise you are less likely to be believed. So a defendant must show that he was suffering from an abnormality of mind. And this is the interesting bit from the 50s, which was caused by arrested or retarded development of mind or an inherent cause of disease or injury. And this substantially impaired his mental responsibility for the killing. Well, there are a couple of things wrong with this, aren't there? And if we think back to the 50s, perhaps this terminology was more um, acceptable then. Um, but to use terminology like arrested or retarded development of mind, of course, you know, we've come a long way in terms of um, terminology and medical technology as well. So I'll take you to the updated law, which is, of course, the most important. So the new law is defined under section 52 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. And just note, when you're citing legislation, you need to include the year of the Act, OK, as well. So the defendant must show at the time of the killing that they were suffering from an abnormality of mental functioning. Just note that when we say he was, um, as the legislation would say, under the Interpretation Act 1978, this um, also includes she or they. OK, so an abnormality of mental functioning. Well, that's a lot better than um, mind. That sounds a bit more technical, a bit more medical. But the best one is the second part which was caused by a recognised medical condition. So that's much better than the lengthy paragraph that we've had in the old law. Um, recognised medical condition indicates we're, we're going to need some medical expert evidence there. And similarly, must substantially impair the mental responsibility for the killing. But there's some additional information here. So this substantial impairment must result in the defendant failing to understand the nature of their conduct or be able to form a rational judgment or be able to exercise self-control. Now, only one of these needs to be shown, okay, which um, in legislation, the, the use of and or or makes a big difference to um, what needs to be proven and what needs to be shown. So a defendant in raising this defence only needs to show one of these things were substantially impaired at the time of the killing. OK. And lastly, which is an addition, is there must be a link from the impairment to the killing. So you could suffer with a medical condition at the time of a killing. But if you fail to show that that impairment or that condition was the reason behind the killing, it, it provides an explanation as to why you killed, then that will be, um, that will not be successful. Okay, so we have to show that the impairment is linked to the killing, kind of like causation in a way. So what we're going to do is go through each of the elements now, just so you have a bit more of an understanding about how you would apply these in a scenario. I think probably what students um, struggle with the most is how do we prove um, that a defendant was suffering from an abnormality of mental functioning at the time. So essentially, it, it's quite easy and it's probably nearly always going to be satisfied. It's based on what um, a fictitious, reasonable person would consider abnormal. So if you believe that the way a defendant has acted is abnormal, it's not what we would call everyday normality, 
then you can tick this one off, okay? And I mean, I think we can all agree for the most part, murder is going to be abnormal, isn't it? It's not something that we would expect people to do. Um, so we can certainly uh, satisfy that. So this comes from the case of Byrne. And just note the year of Byrne because this is prior to the Coroners and Justice Act, of course. It was just after this defence came about um, in its original form from the Homicide Act. But case law will still be appropriate only if it's overruled um, either by a later case or overruled in legislation will this not apply anymore. So we still have to prove abnormality of, as it was here, <clears throat> the mind, or as it is now, mental functioning, okay? And all we do is we simply compare the defendant's actions um, to or um, consider whether, based on what a reasonable person thought, are they abnormal? So Byrne was, um, just a brief summary of the facts, a sexual psychopath who strangled a young woman and mutilated her body. He was unable to control his perverted desires, so he was unable to stop himself um, from carrying out this crime. And, you know, the question begs, is this normal or is this abnormal in the eyes of a reasonable person? I mean, the critic in me would say perhaps this test needs overhauling. Um, but, you know, we can say, yes, this is most likely going to be considered abnormal. Hopefully you all agree with me. <laughs> um, so conditions which could amount to this, you know, what, what are we going to consider as um, a condition that could amount to a, an abnormality of mental functioning and therefore could be considered a recognised medical condition? Just note that medical evidence must be provided. And the key case for this um, is the case of Martin. So we will look at um, the case of Tony Martin in more detail when we come to look at the defence of self-defence, because this is um, a man who was charged with murdering um, an intruder in his, her in his farmhouse in Norfolk, famously. Um, this case is very famous, 1999. And um, he shot an intruder. Um, and unfortunately killed the intruder, who was a 16-year-old boy. So the boy and an adult had broken into his home, and it, it, um, on the evidence, it wasn't the first time. Um, Tony Martin had a, um, in his illegal possession a firearm. He didn't have a licence, which, of course, he was charged for. But at the trial, he sought to raise self-defence, and defending his property, which, um, you know, by law you can act um, proportionately and reasonably. Um, the prosecution was successful in convincing the jury that he hadn't acted reasonably, proportionately, necessarily. So he was convicted of murder and it just sparked a huge media campaign, um, one of which you could you could look at online. Um, particularly newspapers like The Sun were saying, you know, we need, we have to have the right to protect our own homes. This put the owners at risk, you know, lack of safety. Um, so his case was really um, famous. Um, so he was in prison, but he, what he did was he sacked his legal team, who he clearly didn't think did a very good job at the original trial. He got a new legal team to look into this case. And his legal team uncovered um, when kind of investigating, you know, just finding a bit more out about his life and his childhood, uncovered a um, condition, really, that Tony Martin had. And this was um, stemming from abuse as a young boy. And it turned out this, this abuse has kind of, had kind of led to paranoia. Um, and they managed to obviously back this up with medical expert evidence, and you need two. Um, and this is a defence, you know, prosecution could bring their own, the court could appoint their own as well if they wanted to counter anything. Um, but they brought this evidence to show that this condition triggered this, at the time, abnormality of mental functioning and led Tony Martin to be able or unable to form a rational judgment. Um, so he understood what he was doing. He was possibly able to exercise self-control, 
But he wasn't rational in the, in the moment, and that's why he shot out. And so he was successful um, on a, a plea of diminished responsibility, which reduced his sentence significantly. Um, so, yes, medical evidence, you know, improving this is recognised is needed. So I'm just going to put a number of um, potential conditions that could give rise to um, a finding of diminished responsibility. You could also add from the Sally Challen case that I mentioned in the beginning, um, coercive control, which could lead to this one at the bottom, battered wife syndrome. Um, it can work the other way around, um, but it was coined this phrase um, resulting from a number of earlier cases um, of women who had suffered abuse and um, killed their husbands to escape that abuse. Um, and the battered wife syndrome um, phrase or, or condition was, you know, recognised medically and it, it kind of culminates um, a number of different symptoms, one including depression as well, okay? Um, Premenstrual tension, you could look, there are a number of different cases um, of where women have um, suffered, you know, severe premenstrual tension and kill people as a result. Um, there are a couple of kind of famous cases um, for that. So do please have a look. And if you if you want me to signpost you with any, I will let you, I'll, I'll give those to you and let you know, okay? Now, these here in italics, epilepsy, diabetes, and sleepwalking, these could be deemed um, to be recognised medical conditions um, that could result in diminished responsibility. It could also be... Um, found to result in insanity or automatism. So when we look at those defences, you'll see a bit of an overlap. And there is certainly an overlap with the defence of insanity with diminished responsibility. Um, absolutely. OK, substantial impairment. This really is going to be based on the facts. So the impairment must have been obviously linked to or brought on by the recognised medical condition and at least one of these things needs to have been, have been satisfied. You make that decision on the facts, okay? At the time, could they understand what they were doing? If they were blacking out, you know, if they were, if they were sleepwalking, then no, they wouldn't be able to. Can they exercise self-control? You know, if they, if they go into a fit of rage, paranoia, schizophrenia, then no, they're not going to be able to. If they are suffering from depression, um, or a um, personality disorder or something similar to um, Tony Martin, then no, they're not going to be able to form a rational judgment at the time. So you link the condition with what you believe that could have been affected and only one um, at the very least needs to be proven. OK, and then, of course, we finish off with just linking the condition to the killing um, as final evidence. Something just to be aware of is um, there have been cases that have arisen where a defendant was also intoxicated at the time. Um, sometimes with depression comes um, reliance on drink or drugs as well. And you could find a defendant raising diminished responsibility on the basis of um, a medical condition. But at the time of the killing, they were also intoxicated. So intoxication alone will not amount to diminished responsibility. If there's a medical condition, then of course the court will consider it. But that medical condition must have been pre-existing. That is the point. Um, putting the intoxication aside, if the intoxication was not present at the time of the killing, would this medical condition have um, caused um, the defendant to suffer an abnormality of mental functioning? Would they, um, their judgment have been substantially impaired? Would it provide a reason for the killing? Okay, and that's the point. You separate the intoxication from the condition itself. That's, a, that's an issue. And there is an authority um, of the case Deutschmann. So Deutschmann um, was at his aunt's funeral, obviously taking um, the news very badly and had been um, drinking significantly. Um, he had got into a fight with somebody who said some disrespectful things and killed them. 
um, so repeatedly kicked and stamped um, on the head. Um, now, at trial, it was uh, raised that he was suffering from an adjustment disorder, okay, so as a result of the, of the grief. But at the time, he'd also drunk substantial whiskey and cider. Had he have not have drunk, this condition would still have been there. Okay, so um, he was successful on diminished responsibility. So just to make sure. There are some other cases that you can look at in this area, a case called Tandy, T-A-N-D-Y, and also a case called Wood, which is an, an older authority. Okay. All right, scenario practice. So this is an old scenario. Um, it actually, under an old um, OCR paper, was a 50 marker, which also required you to consider loss of control as well. But what I'd like you to do is have a read of this and think if you can advise Millie whether she can raise diminished responsibility for um, Cole's murder. OK, and have a look at the history with any scenario. You obviously need to recognise who the parties are, what the issues are. Um, use the scenario. I always recommend um, rubbing out or crossing out the bit of the scenario that you that you've talked about in an in a in an answer, because every every sentence is there for a reason. Okay. So hopefully um, you're reading that, and I'm going to take you through some application. So this is the way that I would answer this question. Note four, assessment objective one marks, understanding of the law. We need to cite law. So the best thing to do is to start with citation of the of the where the actual defence falls. So section 52 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. Use the parties' names. You know, I've started by saying Millie must satisfy the test because, of course, you know, that shows relevance. Um, so I've put citation of law. Uh, mainly in black, and then application for assessment two in red. Okay, um, so Millie must be suffering from an abnormality of functioning. So I've said her actions would be considered as abnormal, not what we reasonably would expect. Okay, remember this is not against what she would normally do. This is against what a what we believe a reasonable person or how a reasonable person would act. So the abnormality must be caused by a recognised medical condition. So I recognise she's got depression, probably stemming from the abuse, most likely. And I've cited a couple of um, cases here. Okay, and Aluelia is quite a famous case um, that I'll talk to you about in a bit. So thirdly, this needs to impair her ability to understand the nature of her conduct or form a rational judgment or exercise self-control. I've I've made a judgment on the evidence that she's unlikely to form a rational judgment. Perhaps she was unable to exercise self-control as well, because after the killing in, in the scenario, she appears to be sorry. Could perhaps link that to the recent Sally Challen case. And because that was decided in the Court of Appeal, that is a reported case. So you can use that. OK. What I haven't got here, which you could gain an additional mark for, is just recognising that her condition um, is the, the reason um, for the killing, OK? We, we can link that there. So conclude that she is likely to be successful and never forget to conclude because you get an extra mark for that. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, there's plenty more uh, scenarios available online. If you went to the Revision World um, website, you could find past papers there. So do, do practice as much as you can. So what we're going to do now is go on to loss of control, which was previously called provocation. And um, provocation really um, was put on the map um, as a result of a, um, a famous case involving Karanjit Alawalia. So she was originally convicted of murder in 1989. Um, and was unable to rely on the old law of provocation because of the, the, the constraints of it. OK, so what did the old law say? The old law was under Section 3 of the Homicide Act, 
Um, so it follows on from diminished responsibility. And it's, it's very short, and you'll be very surprised how short it is in comparison to the new law. So a jury must find that a person was provoked by things said or done to lose their self-control. Um, and in essence, the way that was interpreted by the courts was that loss must be sudden and temporary. So you lose control in the, in the spur of the moment. The provocation, the provocation sorry, must be enough that a reasonable man would act in the same way. OK, so, I mean, what I'm going to do is take you to um, look at some cases that failed because of the, the strictness of this defence and just have a think about what the issues are. So, Karanda Aliwali are being the most um, famous. And this is the, the case that um, the film is based on that I said about provocation. It is a bit of a cheesy um, film. It has Phil Mitchell from EastEnders as um, the police detective. But honestly, I, I do recommend that you watch it so you understand this case. It's a, quite a hard hitting, um, important case in relation to this area. So um, the film shows, you know, she's suffering years of abuse from her husband. And one evening while he's asleep, she um, set him on fire in his bed. He died in hospital. She was convicted of murder. So she, she raised evidence to show that she'd killed out of desperation. And this was really a build-up of um, abuse, uh, a build-up of um, desperation really, which resulted in this kind of um, the old saying, straw that broke the camel's back. You know, she, she acted in order to um, defend herself in a way uh, um, and protect herself in the future. So, um, you know, she had a legal team and there were several appeals. Um, she was eventually successful based on the defence of diminished responsibility, in fact. Um, but her case did spark a review of, the, of these defences and the Law Commission, the um, full-time permanent body for reform, actually looked into this area. And as a result, thanks to the Law Commission, we do have the Coroners and Justice Act with, um, with kind of updated, um, certainly lots of control being the main defence um, with the most changes. So the condition um, was this term that was coined battered wife syndrome okay um uh, so as i said the court eventually uh used this case and um, parliament changed the law of provocation um and what the what kind of the main changes that came from this case and and the others that you'll see in a minute was that you don't um provocation not necessarily re require losing control in that split second, this can be a build-up of conduct that provokes you in the end um, to decide to kill. So this is what we call slow burn provocation. And that's one of the main changes to the new law now, recognising that not everybody who loses control or is provoked um, will snap in the moment. Okay. So it kind of recognises the, the abuse um, that people suffer. There are two other similar cases um, of women, um, and I'm sure there are cases, you know, involving men out there as well. Um, but of course, we, we can only ever um, teach about and know about reported cases um, in the court of and above. Um, so you've got Sandra Thornton and you've got Duffy here as well. So um, both women had suffered abuse and killed their husbands and failed to use any partial defence, okay? So let's have a look at the new law. So the Coroners and Justice Act covers loss of control. It's a pretty significant, substantial piece of law under sections 54 and 55. The defence will be available where the defendant's action was a result of their loss of control. OK, so they kill as a result of losing control. Um, and that killing was caused by a qualifying trigger. Now, there are two triggers and this is the difference. 
between the old law and the new law. The old law says you kill um, because you're provoked by things said or done. But the new law also includes a trigger of fear. You kill through fear of serious violence. When you think about these women in the previous cases, um, credible reasons, um, a credible argument as to why, why they killed their abusive husbands. Thirdly, a reasonable person with, um, who shares the same characteristics as the defendant might have reacted in the same or a similar way. So a bit wider than the older test. Some key things to note that uh, are also covered in this legislation. The loss of control no longer needs to be sudden. Okay, you'll find that under section 54. So I do want you to match this summary with the sections and subsections. This is what will get you top marks in this area, that accuracy and detail. But there are some exclusions. If you kill in revenge, um, either for revenge or you incite revenge, um, then you will not rely on this defence. Also, if you kill because of infidelity, in other words, cheating, you know, unfaithfulness in a relationship, that alone will not excuse um, your killing in this way. And of course, um, the prosecution must disprove beyond reasonable doubt that a defendant lost self-control. Okay, so that is the law. But I tell you, when you look at it, you think, wow, this is huge. So I would like you, please, to um, just pause and have a look at your law. Um, if you've got booklet I've given you great you can um, highlight those or you can print out the law directly from legislation.gov.uk and um, see if you can find where I've taken these tests from and match them with the sections and subsections okay so we're going to go through each of these um, in a bit more detail so um, we know about losing control this is what this defense is about but the loss of control must be as a result of a qualifying trigger. So the triggers are under section 55, subsections 3 and 4. Firstly, you can kill if you fear serious and personal violence from the victim against you or another. So if you're a mother or a father, you, you kill a partner you might fear serious violence, not just against you, but against your children, for example. Or, um, and this is a bit of a mouthful, um, the victim said or did something which constituted you to have extremely grave circumstances or caused you to feel seriously, justifiably wrong. Okay. Now, what does this even mean? Essentially, if we're going to rely upon these triggers, so let's just look at the fear one first of all. If you kill because you fear serious and personal violence, sounds similar to self-defence, doesn't it? Um, what the Law Commission have done quite sneakily is they've suggested that we have almost a partial self-defence added in. You lose control and you kill because you fear serious and personal violence against you or another. So you're defending yourself or another um, from serious violence. But remember, the effect of this defence is different to the um, self-defence because this is a partial defence. And it's always been a criticism of the Law Commission that we do not have a halfway house for self-defence. It's all or nothing. And you see that with Tony Martin, you know, he failed to convince the jury of his protection of himself and his property. Um, uh, and so therefore he was given a mandatory life sentence. There was no halfway house. Had this have been around, he may have succeeded in arguing that he lost control through fear of serious and personal violence. And you see, there's no other explanation. I mean, in the legislation, there's no other information about this. So this is purely what we call subjective. Did the defendant fear or not? You bring evidence to show that you feared at the time, 
Um, you could show a history, a build-up of that, because section 54, subsection 2 says that your loss of control does not need to be sudden. And then you're home and dry. Um, you could raise the other trigger as well. It could be and or. Okay, So both don't have to be satisfied. It depends what's right for your circumstances. Um, you could argue that things have been said or done. So somebody, the victim, says something to you or they do something to you. So again, this could rec um, reflect the, if it was an abuse case, you know, the physical and verbal abuse, the coercive control, but also the physical abuse potentially, which constituted extremely grave circumstances. Now, the word grave in law, um, I know grave can be a grave, but the word grave can mean serious, you know, really dark, really awful. So it would follow that this would mean that what, as a result of what's been said or done to you, this has caused you to feel that this is really serious. This has caused really serious circumstances. If it's physical, then it would be serious. OK, and that's what we take from the word grave. OK, um, now this is probably more likely to be objective. Do we believe that this is serious or not? OK, but the second part, or cause the defendant to feel seriously, justifiably wronged. This could be subjective. Did the defendant at the time feel seriously, justifiably wronged? So how did they feel? Is it serious enough? Did they feel it serious enough? Um, so really, we're not looking at anything trivial. We're not looking at somebody making a passing comment. We're looking at the nature and the circumstances of what was said or done to the victim. Is it serious enough um, to warrant the reaction by the defendant in the killing? Okay, And that's what makes it excusable or not. And of course, um, under Section 55, if you incite the above conduct, if you provoke, in other words, a victim to say things or do things, if it's a bit of um, to and froing, then you're not going to be able to raise this defence. In essence, what you need to show through a trigger is that although you've killed, you were essentially the victim um, in, in you know, one form or another. Um, so you won't be able to use the defence if you've incited the conduct or if you've um, acted in revenge, if you've killed in revenge, OK? And also um, sexual infidelity will not be able to be raised either. This comes from um, quite a, again, a reported famous case um, from 2012 of um, Mr Clinton. And there are some um, links to his case here. It's quite a sad case. Um, if it, please do read about it. Um, a man who kind of suffered um, some pretty uh, awful kind of mental abuse from his wife. They were separated. Um, he found out she was cheating. So he'd um, actually hacked into her Facebook account and found evidence of that. Um, she left him um, a few weeks before he killed her, so she moved into her mother's home. Um, and when she later visited him, um, he did kill her. Um, and prior to that, there had been um, evidence brought to court to show that um, there was a potential kind of uh, allegation of her uh, not allowing him to see the children um, and other bits like that, that that left him quite desperate. So um, what he actually did was, I mean, it, it, the post-mortem showed she died from head injuries and asphyxia. So he obviously tried to strangle her um, and he also filled the house with gas fumes and left her in there. OK, um, so the police came uh, um, when they were called and found her like that. Now, he was found guilty of um, killing her and he was found guilty of murder. Um, he had tried to raise the defence um, of loss of control. And according to him, he lost control um, based on three things. So firstly, 
his wife or separated wife had told him she'd had sexual relations with five men and described to him in graphic detail the acts that they performed. Secondly, she laughed and taunted him about the suicide website that he had been looking at on his computer. Thirdly, she told him she no longer wanted the children. So these three things, um, he said, were things said or done that constituted him to have grave circumstances and caused him to feel um, seriously justifiably wronged. The problem was the trial judge, so the judge at his trial, ruled out this defence to the jury because he, the, the judge said that the words relating to any cheating should be disregarded because, of course, there's, there's an exclusion. You cannot kill and, and raise this defence based on infidelity. Um, so the jury were left actually with diminished responsibility to decide, but they rejected this and found him guilty of murder because, of course, there had been a lack of evidence for diminished responsibility um, brought to trial. So this case went to the Court of Appeal in 2012. So England, Wales, um, Court of Appeal. And the court actually raised that, or, or ruled, sorry, that this defence should have been considered. Loss of control should have been considered. And the jury should have been invited to um, make a decision. It was not necessarily for um, the judge to rule it out. So they ruled a retrial. Um, but I guess, um, or probably, you know, uh, could be considered to be really sad state of affairs, Mr Clinton, um, could not face another trial. So he <clears throat> decided he didn't want another appeal and um, pleaded guilty and is now serving um, a life sentence. So he did that on the first day of the retrial at Reading Crown Court because they lived in Bracknell in Berkshire. Um, he entered a plea of guilty. Perhaps he just couldn't face it any longer. Okay, so infidelity on its own will not be a, um, enough as evidence to amount, amount to a qualifying trigger, but coupled with other things, it will. Thirdly, in thinking about the um, reasonable person test, the law is now, would a reasonable person sharing the same characteristics as the defendant, and in brackets, age and sex, close brackets, might have reacted in the same or similar way. So note, we have to take into account characteristics of the defendant, their age, and this has been inserted because of this case of Pumplin here. This involved a boy, um, so 15 years old, who had been sexually abused by an older man who laughed at him and Camplin reacted by hitting him over the head and killed him. And Camplin, um, who was originally convicted of murder, um, this went up all the way up to the House of Lords in the end, um, was, uh, this conviction was reduced because the, at trial, the jury should never have considered um, how this defendant acted in comparison to a reasonable adult. Um, and of course, in 1978, this was exactly what the old law said. It just said comparing to a reasonable man. Um, and it was wrong. So age must be taken into account. If, it, if you have a child defendant or a younger defendant or an older defendant, you take into account their age. How would um, a reasonable 15 year old react? Probably in the same way. OK. Um, in terms of sex, of course, take into account gender. Um, where appropriate, but we do not take into account any any other factors. If a defendant is particularly vulnerable, if they have um, a condition, then diminished responsibility is the one for them, not loss of control. Um, and this comes from a case called Attorney General for Jersey v. Holly from 2004. It was a case decided in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council where a defendant who hacked his wife to death, um, he was an alcoholic, tried to raise um, that, he, well, he tried to raise that he'd been provoked into killing her. And um, when he was compared 
to a reasonable person, of course, he failed. He tried to argue, well, I'm not a reasonable person. You know, I've I've got alcoholism and another number of other things. The court ruled this is not to be taken into account. OK, so we only take into account age and sex. Arguably unfair, um, but diminished responsibility would be the defence for you if there is a condition there. OK, and just note. This reasonable person of age and sex might have reacted in the same or similar way. So you don't even have to um, prove or show evidence that somebody else would have definitely reacted in the same or similar way. So it's quite wide, isn't it? Um, so a lot of difference, a lot of difference here. OK, so what I would like you to do, you've got um, this table in your booklets, but I would like you to spend some time summarising this law. OK, and you see we can put it into kind of four boxes. You separate it out for diminished responsibility um, and loss of control. You put the sections up here. So section 52, Coroner's Justice Act 2009, sections 54 and 55. Then you'll have your abnormality of mental functioning caused by a red, recognised medical condition, substantial impairment, provides an explanation for the conduct. Loss of control you have, you must lose loss of control, does not need to be sudden. You've got your qualifying triggers in here, then you've got your reasonable person test in here, and then your couple of exclusions there. Okay, and make sure that you include the relevant case laws. I've given it to you and sections, certainly sections for loss of control. I hope that that makes sense, and I'll just finish this tutorial with um, a scenario for loss of control. Okay, so please do have a um, quick read of this. And the question is, advise Evan whether he can raise loss of control for the murder of Mariana. So note that some questions can be specific and just simply ask you to consider the defence, in which case you don't need to consider liability for murder. You don't need to go through the actus res and mens rea for murder. You simply go straight to the defence. So once you've looked at that, um, this is, in essence, how I would set out my answer. Um, so I would start by saying, again, in the same way, Evan must satisfy the test in section 54, well, 54, sorry, in 55. He must lose control, subsection 1, and you can write them like this. And that loss of control does not need to be sudden. If you wanted. And then you apply. He clearly has slow burn provocation through the different classes because there's a history there, and you'll often see that in scenarios. On this particular day, he snaps when he grabs Mariana and punching her. So he has lost control. And it's not sudden, which we know from the legislation is fine. So remember that loss must have been caused by a qualifying trigger under section 55, subsection 3, either that he feared serious violence. Or subsection four, that things were said or done which constitute circumstances of an extremely grave character and gave him a justifiable sense of being seriously wronged. So don't forget to use the wording, OK? Don't just put things said or done. I know it would be tempting. So we, I mean, here we could say, well, he doesn't appear to fear Mariana, OK? So the fear trigger wouldn't apply. But potentially the things said or done would apply. So she's laughed at him for struggling with his work. But is this serious enough? Arguably, no. Laughing alone would not be. And the history um, between them is not arguably serious enough either. And that's a judgment. You know, if you whether you agree or disagree um, with the next person or whether an examiner agrees or disagrees with you will not have any impact in terms of marking. It's your um, use of the law and your reasoning that gives you the marks. OK. Often in mark schemes, there's an alternative outcomes available. So would a reasonable person, um, and I could have put more here, sharing the same or um, characteristics as the defendant, including age and sex, might have reacted in the same or similar way. And you could put the cases here. You could put um, Attorney General for Jersey v. Holly, Holly being H-O-L-L-E-Y. Um, you could also put Camplin as well, okay? 
So although Evan has depression, so I've recognised he's depressed, maybe diminished responsibility is um, the right one for him instead. This has influenced his reaction. It's unlikely that a reasonable man of similar age and sex would react in this way to Mariana. Okay, so his depression doesn't have bearing here. So I conclude that he is unlikely to be successful. And as his lawyer, you may want to advise him um, to raise diminished responsibility in addition or instead. Okay, so that concludes the tutorial. I hope that makes sense um, for this area. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody.